perennial human desire. Anthropologists, historians study human beings for as much evidence as they have, all cultures, and as far as I can tell, storytelling and dancing and other artistic expressions, simple carvings are something that human beings have always found very compelling and passed on from generation to generation. In more sophisticated cultures, we love to immerse ourselves in more sophisticated stories, images, sounds that are unique, beautiful, self-affirming, or profound. We love to immerse ourselves in music, movies, books, paintings, and architecture. But art has not always flourished in uh, human history. Right? Uh, the historical evidence is very scanty for much of human history. Uh, in some places there has been right, art, but the culture has produced a small amount, while overwhelmingly the energy the human beings had was focused on other activities, bare survival, military conquest, in some cases ascetic spiritualism. But in a few places in human history, art has flourished and it has flourished magnificently. Those of us who love art, as well as professional art historians, get extraordinarily excited right, by the amount of art that was produced in some areas, and all of the evidence shows that the art was produced in huge quantities, that it was enjoyed by many, right, many people and it was produced in such high quality that it has survived across the generations and speaks still to us in contemporary times. Why is this, right? Why is it that art has flourished in Renaissance Florence, right, for example? Why there? Why then? Why not, for example, in nearby Milan or nearby Naples? Or if we go back further in art history, art in Athens was a magnificent right, artistic culture and we are still drawn to visit Athens if we are interested in art. But we can ask the same question, why in nearby, uh, <clears throat> why in nearby Sparta, for example, there was no art right, produced in significant quantities or going a little bit further north to Macedon, another fairly vigorous culture, but very little right, by way of art. Or in more contemporary times, we look at the late 1800s in Paris, and Paris was a hotbed of innovative artistic activity, but again in nearby Prussia, just a few hundred miles or kilometers, not much of significance is going on artistically. And of course, here we are today in Hong Kong, in Kowloon City, and our question is about the prospect for Hong Kong and Kowloon to become a significant player in the world artistic scene. The question is, what can we learn from the previous times in which art has flourished and achieved something magnificent uh, and apply them to the contemporary context? What are, the, what are the prospects here for Hong Kong to become one of the world centers for great art? All right, <clears throat> so I want to look at uh, four examples, right, historically, and I've telegraphed right, some of them. Uh, if you read our history books, right, as, uh, as I do, I've got a collection of them on the books, and one way of doing this is to say when the exciting times are, uh, and of course our historians, they gather the best of the historical record, but what is striking is that there will be many art cultures across the world and across time, and they will get several pages in the art history book devoted to them. But if you get to classical Athens, suddenly it's not just a few pages, it's dozens of pages. Right? Or you get to Renaissance Italy, Florence and Venice. Again, a large chunk of the art history book is devoted there. Same thing for uh, the Dutch Golden Age, Rembrandt, Vermeer and others the same for 19th century Paris. So I want to focus on these eras and ask, why did they stand out? What was going on such that they were able to produce art, 
not only uh, uh, a large quantity of art, but art that was innovative and of a quality that lasts across generations and even in some cases across generations. Such cultures are very rare phenomena in art history. All right, so let's uh, first go to, uh, to Athens. This is a contemporary picture of Athens. Uh, it's now a modern, sprawling, right, uh, urban city, but uh, much of it has been preserved, particularly areas in the Acropolis, uh, which, is, uh, which is shown here. One thing that stands out about the great art cultures is uh, innovation. They always are innovative. And one thing that starts uh, is very striking about Athenian art is that it was uh, innovative. Now this is perhaps 2,500 years ago. Uh, human historical records go back perhaps 30,000 years. But something unique and special started to happen in Athens that had never happened anywhere in the world any time in all of human history. And I'll just indicate one of those things that started to happen by means of this statue here. This is a spear bearer. If you've uh, seen uh, Greek statues before, it looks like a Greek statue. You have seen right, many of them. But what is distinctive about a sculpture like this in the context right, of art history? And again, we do some comparison here. So here is a Sumerian right, piece. Uh, many of these are made. It's a Middle Eastern piece, several thousand years old. Uh, and if you look at the art that was produced by the Sumerians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, you'll see variations right on this theme. What you have is a vertical figure that is somewhat stylized, and it is very static. Right? Here is a fertility statue. Right, one of the uh, ancient ones going back many uh, thousands of years, and again, there are hundreds or, or thousands of these that have been discovered, and there are minor variations on the theme. Obviously, the female attributes are exaggerated, but again, it's very symmetrical, right? it's vertical, and it is static. Right, another example. The Egyptians produced a great art culture, and here is a sample for right, the Egyptian statue. And if you look at them across hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the kings, the pharaohs, the queens, and other generals, they all have this vertical static right, formulation right, as well. Now this is not to underplay that this is a major achievement. This is difficult to accomplish. There's sophistication right built into this. But for thousands of years, this is the height right, of human artistic sculptural right, creation. And in this context, right, the Greek statue, right, the one at the right, stands out right, for being unique because in it, there is naturalism and there is movement. Right? And it's a movement from side to side and it's movement right, from front to back. And there's also tension in that the, the verticality is not completely symmetrical on both sides of the body. Right? The, uh, the legs are shifting, the weight is shifting, and so forth. To be able to do that, extraordinarily difficult, that innovation was first achieved by the Greeks, uh, as far as the historical record shows. And then the Greeks, having made this innovation, went on to be able to develop dynamical movement to portray the human body astoundingly. So here's uh, an example from just two centuries later. Right? The, this is a female figure, but here we have female power, right, in a forward, right, thrusting gesture, right, the robes flowing right across her body. Uh, this is a uh, male figurine just discovered less than 20 years ago in a sunken ship off the coast of uh, Italy. A male figure, male power, this is the same statue uh, in, a, in a rear view. Again, male power, dynamism, right, to capture the end of something that is static. Here's another uh, figure of a, a female, a Nike. Uh, I like this one. It's not necessarily a warrior, right, or a, a, or a goddess. This is a woman and a very simple right, uh, gesture of adjusting her sandal. But nonetheless, you have feminine movement, right, captured uh, beautifully. Uh, an athlete, right? uh, uh, not a god, not a hero, not a general, 
but the kind of athlete the Greeks would have uh, honored, right, who was successful at the Olympic Games, and again, an original uh, composition form. And then uh, uh, in Hellenistic times, this Greek tradition, uh, once the Romans had conquered the Greeks, right, uh, it starts to go down here, but it is reached where you would have almost an orgy, right, of movement in multiple directions in the famous Loakawan right, sculpture. All right, so innovation is one feature of the eras, right, of great art. And what you find strikingly is art historical traditions prior to the Greeks would be many centuries of the same thing over and over again with minor variations. The Greeks started doing something different and they did multiple variations in increasingly sophisticated form very quickly. Uh, and why did this happen in Athens? Right? Uh, Sparta, we know also, was a powerful culture. Macedon, another powerful culture, but they did next to nothing in the case of art. Uh, Athens was a powerful culture, and it also developed a great art culture as well. So here, I want to put some dates to you. If you uh, study Greek culture, Greek history, right, you uh, will become familiar with these names, Aeschylus, Sophocles, right, Euripides, three great Greek tragedians, uh, Ictinos, Colocrates, Phidias, Myron, uh, and Myron, those are uh, sculptors, uh, many of them working on the Parthenon and flourishing which, uh, in these dates here. Aristophanes, perhaps the greatest uh, comic playwright of all time, Praxiteles, another sculptor. But what I'd like you to do is notice the dates here. Aeschylus is the earliest, right, of the greatest. He's born in 525. What that means is that by the time he is 25 years old, he is now a mature man, uh, it becomes the 400s, right, in Greece. So he comes to maturity in the late 400s, and all of the great Greek artists in literature, sculpture, and from what we can tell also in painting, are of the 400s. That is the golden century, right, of Greek art. Why the 400s, right, in Athens? What I'd like to point to next is what had gone on in Athens in the century previous right, to the 400s. So let's go back to the 500s. If we uh, uh, now study economic history, what we find is that the Greeks in the 500s developed a market economy. They stopped being smallholders under a largely feudal aristocratic system with tight import-export controls not wanting to do much trade with foreigners. Instead, the Greeks decided to specialize in producing just a very few things and realized that other cultures around the Mediterranean could produce other things in higher quality at lower cost than they could do, and that if they started trading sophisticatedly with everybody else, then they would be better off, and they did become spectacularly wealthy in doing so. They uh, got rid of almost all of their import and export controls, developed uh, one of the earliest free trade zones, right, as far as we can tell. They were the first to develop coinage and to use uh, coins for uh, engaging in, uh, coin money for engaging in trade all over. And they were committed to having a sound currency. No debasement right, of the currency right, was allowed, so that their currency became the dominant right, currency uh, as well. Uh, they opened their doors to immigrants, particularly skilled immigrants from all over the Mediterranean. Anybody who had any knowledge, any skill, was largely welcomed in Athens. And they developed a culture of traders who went off to spoil the world, had new experiences, brought back new ideas, and of course, wealth back to Athens. Athens became the richest city ever in human history by several orders of magnitude in less than one century because they developed a generally open market economy. That was an economic innovation. We also need to mention Politics, 
All the first, the Greeks are famous for the first uh, time ever in human history, widespread experiments in democratic political organization, widespread participation right among the uh, citizenry, uh, divisions of power, uh, regular elections, regular transfers of power. Uh, Solon in the late 500s is the first to introduce a significant number of democratic reforms. Uh, Greece's history, of course, over the 500s politically was back and forth between being more democratic, being a little more authoritarian, soft dictatorship, until in 508 there was another uh, strongly democratic move under Cleisthenes, and reintroducing, and those are the ones that largely stuck. And so then the point is that by the time we get to around 500, Athens is spectacularly rich market economy and largely a democratic political system. Of course, uh, Persia was the great power off to the east, right? Uh, the Greek city-states that were experimenting in democracy were small and often scattered, and there was a great fear about whether they would be able to withstand the might of the mighty Persians. Uh, and of course, there was a great war that was fought and the Athenians and the other city-states got their act together militarily. They were able to beat back the Persians, and this was an enormous right, sense of pride. We fought for our independence, and we succeeded. Uh, we can do anything. Now, the point then is that the artists right, were born into this kind of culture, right? a culture that was free politically, that prized itself for independence, that had enormous wealth, and an enormous cosmopolitan outlook on the world. One other factor I want to mention that seemed to be largely unique about the Greeks, and that is their religion and philosophy. The Greeks, of course, are also famous for being the first to do philosophy systematically. If you look at the, uh, the major philosophers, the uh, ones leading up to Socrates who were laying the foundations of philosophy, all of them are in the 500s. At the same time that there's an economic revolution, there's a political revolution, there is a philosophical revolution. Greek religion also is famous for being very uh, naturalistic and worldly. The gods and the goddesses are like exalted human beings, but we recognize them as human in their aspirations and their desires and their strategies and so on. And the Greeks, partly because they were trading all over, became very tolerant about the idea of religious diversity. They uh, tended to evaluate religions in terms of their being able to help people live and uh, flourish successfully. They were open to importing new gods and new goddesses as they encountered them. And they were open to people who were immigrating into Athens, bringing with them their own religions, and by and large, having a live and live, let live uh, policy. So what I want to argue then, this will be my first claim, is that the reason why Athens developed a great art culture in the 400s was precisely because cultural groundwork had been laid in philosophy, in religion, in economics, and in politics. It had a relatively open, free, commercial, tolerant, democratic, uh, naturalistic, diverse culture. All right, that's one claim. Now let's try <clears throat> to uh, categorize this, there's the economics, there's the politics, there's the religion and the philosophy. And as far as we can tell, historically, first time ever, anywhere, this concentration of cultural elements came together by 500, then you had a great explosion of artists born into that kind of a world, and then artistic innovation and high quality art. All right, let's try uh, another culture. Now we jump ahead uh, almost <coughs> two millennia to Florence, right, Italy. This is the skyline. It's almost a work of art right, itself. Right? It's, uh, it is so beautiful. And now let's uh, consider a few examples sort of uh, representative 
right, green card. So this is three that I've chosen just because they are uh, all of the same theme, the David, but three different treatments, right, of the David. This is Donatello's, right, David in the middle 1400s. <clears throat> this is Michelangelo's David in the uh, late 1400s. Uh, this is Caravaggio's right, painting, right, of David, uh, having cut off the head of Goliath a little bit later. Of course, uh, also Leonardo was a Florentine. Uh, Michelangelo's famous Pieta, which was now down in Rome, now as well. Raphael's tribute to all of the great schools of philosophy, which with uh, Plato and Aristotle, which centrally located there. The perspective stands out. Different kind of work. This is Michelangelo's teacher, teacher Grolandio, like an old man with a boy. Of course, you notice it's a very naturalistic portrait of a man, including his deformity right in his nose, the affection of his grandson. In the background, you see some nature right in a perspectival right, form as well. So all of the art historians right, will say Florence, awesome, original, innovative things that right, were going on. Uh, we could also say some things about Venice, but not much in other places in Italy. Right? There was artistic activity going on in Milan, but it was largely Florentine artists who were invited to come there to work. Or in Rome, but again, there were Florentine or Venetian artists who were brought down to do the work there, like Michelangelo, for example, and the same thing in Naples as well. So why was Florence developing this magnificently innovative, high-quality art culture, but not other Italian cities? Right? Same culture, same background in many respects, but something special is happening first in Florence and a little bit later in, um, <clears throat> in, in, uh, in Venice. All right, so let's uh, first look at the dates Right, that are significant here. Brunelleschi is often cited as uh, the, the, in art history uh, as the person who first developed right, perspective. Uh, and of course, one of the great achievements of Renaissance art is a very sophisticated working out of perspective right, in, uh, in painting. He is also the, uh, the, the one who designed the dome uh, that dominates the Florentine skyline a brilliant engineer right, able to uh, construct a dome of that size and scale. Uh, the Romans had done similar ones uh, 1,300 years ago. That engineering knowledge had been lost for a, a significant amount of time. But notice, uh, again, his dates. So I took born in 1377. So by the time it becomes 1400, again, he is a young man. And then all of the artists whom uh, we revere and love and the art historians spend a great deal of time on, Giberti, Donatello, Angelico, Masaccio, Botticelli, Gerondaio, Leonardo da Vinci, Lippi, Michelangelo, Raphael, Cellini, right, and so on. These are the standout figures. And you notice all of them are in the 1400s going on into the 1500s. That's the great century of Florentine genius right, in the arts. But what's going on in Florence in the century prior to Brunelleschi? And here, the important point is that in the 1300s, Florence became spectacularly wealthy, the wealthiest city by a significant margin in all of Europe, certainly, and certainly uh, all of the world uh, at that point. How did they do so? They, again, decided that they were going to be traders to trade all over Europe, North Africa, right, the Middle East. They weren't going to try to produce everything themselves. Instead, they would produce what they were good at and become skilled at developing trade networks. They became financial originators, developing new banking instruments, new financial instruments. The Florentines were the first proto-capitalist free market right, society in the modern world. It took it to a high level of sophistication and became enormously wealthy right, as a result of doing so. It's also, uh, of course, the same thing if you're interested in Venice that was going on in Venice, unlike the other Italian city-states. Venice became a commercial trading culture right, all over. 
politics is certainly important. Florence threw off its feudal past and became self-consciously a republic, vigorously a republic, with regular elections, divisions of power, uh, power put in tension with each other, uh, all of those institutions, right, of republicanism, the Florentines experimented with them vigorously in the 1300s. And then by the time we get to the 1380s, that transformation had largely uh, come into existence. And of course, if you're interested in Venice, Venice also right, was politically a republic. It threw off its feudal past. Almost none of the other Italian city-states right, became republican. Right? They remained feudal in various ways uh, and so forth. So what you then have is by the time we get to the end of the 1300s, Florence is both politically an open, broad participatory republic and a spectacularly wealthy, cosmopolitan, market-oriented economy. And it's precisely that culture that the great generations of art artists are born into. They're born into many of the sculptures, strikingly goldsmith families and with tight connections to banking families. So these were young men, largely, who could get a very good education, who could travel the world, who had access to, uh, to wealth and to other people who were prosperous. They were the ones who went on to develop, those sons and grandsons, largely, the uh, original art that Florence is prized for. Religion and 